Bem-vindos ao IbraCast, o um podcast quinzenal trazido especialmente a você pelo IbraC, o Instituto Brasileiro de Estudos de Concorrência, Consumo e Comércio Internacional. Nosso podcast vai explorar os mundos fascinantes e cada vez mais interdisciplinares do antitrust, do direito do consumidor, do comércio internacional e da regulação em sentido estrito. A cada episódio serão convidados especialistas, dentre autoridades, advogados, economistas e acadêmicos, para participarem dos debates mais atuais e relevantes das áreas de atuação do Instituto. Fiquem ligados e curtam o programa. Hi everyone, this is Bruno Becker again. Uh, today, as you can see, we have our first uh, edition of Ibrocast in English because we have a foreign guest speaker. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really thrilled and and uh, to present this Ibrocast today because it's a topic I'm very fond of: digital markets, and we couldn't be in a better company. So, Charlotte is the Competition Policy Director at Public Knowledge. And prior joining Public Knowledge, Charlotte worked in the Anti-Competitive Practice Division of the Federal Trade Commission. Welcome, Charlotte. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's an honor for us. And we also have like two really good friends, Marcela Machuzu, who is a partner at MCA and a PhD candidate at USP, and Silvia Almeida, who is a director at LCA and also director at uh, IBRAC for Digital Markets Group. Welcome, Silvia and Marcela. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Charlotte, for accepting our invitation. Awesome. So before we start here with the questions and, and the dialogue, uh, I, I asked Marcela to, to talk a little bit about this digital markets background. What's the state of art today? Because it's a, a bit of a complex topic with uh, several uh, recent uh, changes. So, Marcela, could you just walk us through what's new here? Sure, absolutely. So, um, focusing very briefly on the main regulatory developments and legislative developments on that have been happening in Europe and in the U.S. focused on digital markets. What has happened in the past, like, seven to eight months? Um in Europe, we had two very important proposals that were, you know, presented at the very end of last year, which we usually call the DMA and the DFA. That's Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act. Both of these, as I mentioned, are legislative proposals. And, you know, in the European context, they're regulation, meaning as the GDPR, for example, which probably people will have heard about, um, it's a legislation that will come into force directly if approved in the member states. So, you know, member states don't have to turn it into national legislation. It just comes into force. And, well, basically, both of these proposals are very much in line with what has been called regulatory competition. And it, it, they, they largely establish rules that companies and precisely big tech, but not only big tech, would have to follow, regardless of um, investigations, antitrust investigations, into whether or not these companies are, in fact, harming the market or harming consumers, right? So there are proposals, ex-ante rules that will have to be followed by um, these companies. And that's perhaps the main thing that they are and the main change that they, that they insert into the current framework that we have in Europe. Um, there's a bunch of discussions about like who exactly, which authority exactly would enforce those rules. All of those, you know, are open-ended questions. And I mean, I'm sure our, our listeners can go into, can go online and check the whole act, the whole proposal. There's a bunch of things there, but mainly they're focused on that. Um, what happened as well was that in June of this year, in the U.S., a package of five bills that are also focused on a sort of like a revamp of antitrust in the U.S. was also proposed in Congress, right? And I mean, that's mainly why we have Charlotte here to talk us through what what that is and what she thinks it means. Um, but as I mentioned, it's um, it's a package of five bills. Um, they have like all different names, but they also have a bunch of elements that come to, to a certain extent, um, have a dialogue with what has been proposed in Europe. Some changes as well, like there are 
specific rules for mergers that would change um, trying to tackle the killer acquisition issue, um, rules regarding self-preferencing, and so forth and so on, portability as well. And, I mean, very recently, very recently, really, like last week, um, we, we had President Joe Biden issuing an executive order that's also aimed at promoting competition in the American economy. Um, and it has, I mean, it is an executive order, so it's not a legislative pack, but it tries to um, basically say what the government will propose and encourage to be done by administrative authorities and so forth uh, in order to promote competition. It also has rules regarding um, tech markets. Uh, it has specifically rules regarding internet and technology. Uh, and lastly, but in my opinion, uh, for sure, not the least important, there's a different bill, the U.S. Innovation Competition Act, um, that's focused, focused on sort of like an industrial policy bill that says how the U.S. will position itself, especially in regards to um, Chinese competition in tech markets. It has, it's really, really, really long. I think it's like over 2,000 pages long. So, I mean, <laughs> I can't sum it up here. Um, more than that, but um, it's also very interesting because it also talks about competition and about, you know, geopolitical competition as well, like how the U.S. is positioned um, when we talk about China and other relevant um, players in the sense of, you know, nations that are competing among themselves. So very shortly, that's, I think, what I can say to give our, our listeners and our, our everyone that's following us an overview of what's happening. Thank you so much, Marcela. Uh, yeah, it's really complex. A lot of things going on, uh, not only in the U.S. but uh, in other countries. And 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 taking what like you were mentioning on this five different bills uh, proposed in the Congress, which are also being called Anti-Monopoly Act. Um, Charlotte, I wanted to hear a little bit from you uh, if you believe that these bills are necessary to change the enforcement in the U.S. Uh, uh, and what do you believe the main achievements can be? Uh, from that. Great. Yeah, we are really excited about these five bills that have been introduced in the House and they cleared their their very first hurdle, which is the markup process where the um, Judiciary Committee, which is the committee that has jurisdiction over antitrust, um, gets to throw all their amendments at it. And there was voting late into the night. It continued until uh, 5 a.m. I think, and and they picked up again at 11 a.m. the next day and went for another many hours. So there was, there's been a lot of debate about these bills, um, but they made it through the markup process, which is a really good sign for um, their ability to pass. So I think it's great that you're um, looking into these bills, and I'm excited to talk about them. Um, so there's five bills. The first one is fairly simple. It's increasing filing fees for mergers um, for the largest mergers. So that'll just help give a little bit more funding to the antitrust enforcement agencies. The other four bills are only focused on what we call big tech um, dominant digital platforms. So while it is like very different from um, existing antitrust law, it's making a lot of changes. Those changes are only applying to the big tech companies. So, yeah, they've got um, very specific definitions of what the criteria are to determine whether this law applies to you. And it's very clear from looking at those definitions that it's basically the companies that we often think of. It's Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, um, and possibly Microsoft. There's been some, some conversation about whether Microsoft is included, but I think they probably are. So the, the new requirements on those companies, um, the first one is interoperability and data portability. This would just make it a lot easier for users to communicate from one platform to another. We think that's really important for competition um, so that people really can switch and so that new businesses can know that if they want to start up, um, they're going to have access to that network. They're not just going to be cut off as soon as they start to show success and start to sort of scare the incumbent firms um, that they'll, they'll have that interoperability protected by law. The second is a non-discrimination requirement. Um, each of these are separate bills, but they're sort of uh, a package that is moving through the process together. So the first bill is that interoperability and data portability. The second one is non-discrimination. 
Um, so this is focused on anti-competitive discrimination that a platform might engage in um, regarding companies that are competing on the platform. So, you know, this is uh, Amazon might be preferencing some retailers over others on their marketplace. Google might be preferencing some search engine results on their search engine results page over others. Of course, there's a certain amount of curation that we want these platforms to be engaged in. So it's important to note that the non-discrimination rule is focused on anti-competitive discrimination. Certainly some amount of discrimination has to happen just to select the most relevant result to put at the top, you know, the, the cheapest product or the one that's gonna come to you the fastest, those kind of criteria. Um, but things that are anti-competitive is what this legislation is about. Yeah, and I have a question on this, on this non-discrimination, because we had uh, recently here in Brazil some discussions on this and some comments on uh, um, um, saying that um, we should use essential facilities theory to, to for digital platforms. Could you elaborate like this? Do you think it does relate to something like that? So the situation we're in in the U.S. is that the essential facilities doctrine within antitrust law is heavily disfavored today. So um, we are not trying to use that as a basis for this legislation uh, because it is so disfavored. Um, instead, we are trying to um, focus on what makes digital platforms special in particular. Um, part of that is this, this gatekeeper power, which is a concept that came over from Europe um, about how they control um, uh, businesses' access to consumers and vice versa. Um, but it's also about some characteristics that are particular to the digital market. You know, the, the impact of data and how um, the economies of scope and scale that, that come with the importance of data to these industries, um, the control that they have over the user interface really allows them to pick winners and losers and um, influence consumer behavior in such a detailed way because they control that user interface and, and because of the data that they're able to collect, they can do this very detailed A-B testing to, to determine what's gonna influence consumers and that can be so effective. So it's a variety of characteristics that I think make up what we call gatekeeper power um, and that, that access to uh, customers is just one of them. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Sylvia, do you have anything to, to comment on that? Yes, actually, uh, I would like to add some comments on that. Being an economist here, I would like to, to know if you have the same impression that I have that maybe economic evidence will become even more important in this kind of investigation because even if you consider the data analysis and how to use the data in the investigation, this is something that economists should be focusing on more or not? What do you feel about, mm -hmm. feel about the experience you face in the US? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is such an interesting question. So the way that the non-discrimination bill is set up, um, the competitive process piece is an affirmative defense. So first litigants would make the prima facie case that discrimination is happening here. And then the defendant would have the opportunity to say, actually, this conduct does not harm the competitive process. So that's where the economic evidence would come in. Um, it's not until you get to that affirmative defense stage. However, I think the, um, the vast majority of enforcement is likely to come from our antitrust enforcement agencies, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice. The bill does have a private right of action, so private parties could also bring cases. Um, there's a long way to go before these bills become law. So things might change as we go. Um, but of course, if you're one of those enforcement agencies, I think in particular, they will be really interested to make sure that they're gonna be able to win on that affirmative defense before they even bring a case. So um, that economic evidence could become important at the very beginning as well. Okay, great, thank you. Marcella? Yeah, I just wanted to add a brief comment here to what Harla has said. Um, I think, I mean, to me, it's very relevant um, that this bills, and I think it's relevant for, for the fact that it's also happening in the U.S., that this bills um, try to focus as well on specific market players. And I mean, 
um, I, I think we have a, a very, as Charlotte already mentioned, a very strong reason for that. Um, but I, I, I wanted to to check with you, Charlotte, um, why do you think that is? And I mean, I, I think I think it's something that's been criticized, right? Like this is focused a lot on big tech, and that is a problem because what if these companies cease to be as important as they are now? Um, what are we going to do? Are we going to just enact other legislation? Um, and I wanted to have like your feeling on that. If if you think that has like some merit, or if, if it doesn't, why why it doesn't? Yeah, that's a great point. So I think of that a, a few different ways. One is we also need broader antitrust reform. So I think of these as two work streams that are happening at the same time in the U.S. context. Um, over in the Senate. Senator Klobuchar has introduced a broad antitrust reform bill. Um, so that's going to address antitrust across the whole economy. On the House side, we have these antitrust bills that are just focused on big tech. And I'm hopeful that we will see companion bills on both sides, right? I'm hopeful that on the House side, we will see broad antitrust reform and that on the Senate side, we will see new laws and rules focused on big tech. I think it's really important to have both of those strategies um, happen and, and come to fruition and, and actually pass into law. Um, I think, as we talked about a little bit, the, the big tech companies are a special case. They have this gatekeeper power. They have these characteristics that I think uh, require more strict rules than the regular mm -hmm. antitrust rules that we put on the, the whole economy. But existing antitrust law is insufficient, you know, even for um, the rest of the economy. There, there are a lot of reforms that we need there. Um, but I think you're right, Marcella, that we want to make sure we are covering, um, you know, that that we're sort of future proofing um, this legislation because it is very difficult to pass legislation in the U.S. context. I want this legislation to last and and be effective for as long as possible. Um, so I do think it would be helpful to give the antitrust agencies a little bit more flexibility in designating which are the firms that should have these rules apply. Um, the current um, legislation, uh, the, the current um, proposed legislation has very specific criteria that say, um, you know, that indicate to us almost exactly who the companies are. Um, it's a certain market capitalization, um, some uh, you know, a number of users, some very specific numerical criteria. And the agency can choose within the companies that that criteria applies to um, who they're going to designate. But I think giving the agency more leeway would help in the future because we may not always be concerned about the companies that have this market capitalization. We're concerned about the companies that have gatekeeper power. And right now that does overlap with these criteria, but I think it could be helpful to have um, more leeway to the agency to expand who is covered because other companies might become equally as important in the future without meeting these numerical criteria. Awesome. Great. Um, and uh, Charlotte, you and Marcel already mentioned some efforts outside the US, uh, mainly in Europe. Um, do you think they go in the same direction? Like, can you just give us a, a, an overview on this and how do they compare with the US? Yes, I think they do go in the same direction. Um, the gatekeeper power terminology and, and concept, I think, is one really important area of overlap, which is um, defining what are the types of companies that we're particularly concerned about. Um, and Marcella mentioned the regulatory competition strategy. You know, that's another area of overlap. Um, it's putting these ex ante rules um, in advance to say, this is the type of conduct that's going to be illegal going forward. Um, one thing that Marcella mentioned was um, that the European uh, model is, um, saying that we're going to put these rules without investigation. Um, and to some extent, I think that's accurate in both the US and European context, except that the investigation has happened, right? I mean, the, the, um, the investigation has been going on to lead to these, this legislation. 
So it's not an investigation in the, the normal way that we like bring an antitrust case. We do an investigation to determine whether they have violated existing laws. But I do think a lot of investigation has taken place that um, has educated these uh, regulators and enforcers about this particular market. Um, but again, that's another similarity that um, they're doing it in this sort of different structure where the investigation is happening of the whole market and it's an investigation of how the law should change and then putting ex ante rules going forward. Another important area of consistency between the European and the US models is that they are focused on two categories of harm. Um, there is insufficient competition happening against these dominant digital platforms, but there are also concerns about how competition is happening on the platform. So we want to make sure that there is fair competition happening in the um, various marketplaces that these platforms control. Um, but we also really want to make sure that competition can happen against these platforms. We want um, new competitors to be able to unseat the gatekeepers. And I think those two important priorities are things that are covered um, both by the European rules and the US uh, proposals. And that's a really important um, dual goal that they have. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and like moving on, uh, I, I want to touch uh, the topic of this uh, recent case dismissed by the uh, uh, by the judiciary of the FTC Facebook uh, case. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to ask uh, Marcela to to briefly explain for for our audience that is not like completely familiar to the systems. What's the difference like between the Brazilian administrative system and the U.S. more judicial system? Yeah, sure. That's that's important because it's also a relevant um, change, like an enforcement rate. Right? So whereas in Brazil, we have CAGI, the Brazilian Antitrust Authority, that is um, responsible for deciding on an administrative level, both regarding mergers and regarding conducts, um, and that case can be taken to the judiciary after a final decision by, by CAGI. Um, in the US, we don't have a model exactly like that. So um, both the FTC and the DOJ have to take their cases to court. So to the judiciary. And um, I think that's a very important distinction. And I think Charlotte can comment on more on that, on, on what makes that hard. I mean, is at the end of the day, is like, is legislation enough if um, the judiciary doesn't change and keeps applying, you know, the same um, standard of proof and the same understandings, um, even with new rules? Thank you, Marcela. So, having this background, uh, Charla, like I just want to hear from you uh, about this uh, case that uh, the judiciary recently dismissed uh, from from FTC, even though it allowed FTC to amend it. Uh, what do you believe that uh, that this po this points to one of the main challenges in antitrust enforcement in the U.S., namely changing the way the courts interpret antitrust law? Yes, so it's a big question, um, and I think we are trying to take that into account as um, we're all working on legislation, um, recognizing how antitrust law has been narrowed and narrowed over time by the courts. Um, so, you know, one strategy for improving antitrust law that you could take and that we've been taking for a long time is bringing those edge cases, having the antitrust enforcement agencies bringing cases and trying to improve the law. And that's a strategy that they've used in the past um, with these pay for delay settlements in pharmaceutical industry. Um, they had a concerted strategy for, I wanna say 10 years. It, it was a very long time where they were trying to build better law. And eventually they were successful um, they got a Supreme Court case in Actavis that said, yes, these pay for delay settlements in the pharmaceutical context can be illegal under antitrust law. Um, but think about the amount of resources and the amount of time that people had to wait um, for that improvement in the law. So it's, it's very slow going. And that is one of the reasons that we think legislation is going to be the much better way to go. Um, and we need to be very careful in crafting that legislation so that it is not giving as much opportunity for courts to 
um, read out important parts of the bill um, or um, you know narrow the law over time in the way that has happened to antitrust. So um, in particular, the, the big tech focus bills are much more specific, taking a pretty different strategy from how um, antitrust law has uh, been written in the past. Um, and the antitrust reform package um, you know, that, that covers the whole economy on the Senate side um, also is particularly focused on a few bad precedents that they want to fix. Um, so they're definitely taking that into account. I do think the Facebook example in particular is a good one about some of the difficulties that we can have in um, showing how powerful these companies really are. Um, some of that power comes from um, ways that are not traditionally uh, accepted in antitrust law, although I, I do think that it was a very strong case from the FTC and I'm hopeful that they can be successful with their amended complaint. Um, but yes, it, it definitely does show why legislation is really important and just bringing cases under current law is not going to be sufficient to address the huge challenges that we're facing. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So, um, okay, moving on. We already talked about enforcement. We talked about the, those five bills. Uh, and there's another bill uh, in the U.S. Congress, uh, which is very large and complex. Uh, it's called the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act. And even though it does not aim at changing antitrust law, it does address antitrust issues, uh, specifically pointing towards China. So I have two questions, and I'm going to break them down into two parts. So the first is, is that the bill uh, seems like a clear industry policy project that looks at technology as a frontier for a dispute with China for leadership in the global scenario. Do you believe this uh, objective could at some point clash with a focus on more severe severe scrutiny on big tech? No, I don't think so, because I think the, the reason that U.S. tech companies have been so successful is because there was an open competitive environment where they were able to thrive. Um, that's why we, you know, that's that's the American strategy, right, is, is that competition will create the best competitors and will push companies to um, innovate and provide great products that the world will love. Um, that is what competition does and that is what competition is supposed to do. And so I think actually by promoting competition and having this new legislation that is going to open up these markets, that is the best way that the U.S. is going to be able to compete on the global scale. Um, so there, it's not at all in conflict. And in fact, I think that these big tech bills will will um, really be a boon to American competitiveness abroad. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. Go on, Marcella. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting. I mean, to look at this also from because this bill specifically is aimed at you know, as I mentioned before, it's sort of like competing with China as, you know, another country that's at the frontier of technology and the world. Um, and it's interesting to look at what China is doing to its own tech companies, right? Um, I mean, the, the antitrust system in, in China is different from the antitrust system in the U.S. Um, the data protection laws in China are different as well. In fact, you know, uh, there's a lot of discussion right now about whether there will be a new data protection legislation in China that could actually drive changes in other countries regarding data protection. And to a certain extent, they're adopting the same approach, right? They're going after their own companies. Um, and, you know, tack, which, you know, if you think about it from a perspective of the, the, Ch the Chinese regime, maybe people would say, okay, that, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Why are they doing that? Um, and, and I think it's it's very interesting to see these movements in the global scale and see where, where it's going, right, from a geopolitical um, point of view. I don't have clarity exactly on where everyone is trying to go, but I think we, it's it's very important to, to, to look at antitrust also from that more general perspective because it helps us understand um, and connect the dots, you know, um, Competition is not, antitrust is not in itself something that exists in vacuum. 
it exists alongside the other policies. So wh where do these um, policies connect and how is important for us to understand what's actually going on. Thank you, Marcela. And like talking about China, um, so we know that Hovenkamp has been one of the critics of the explicit, explicit focus on China, and he claims that enforcement should determine priorities, not legislation. Um, Charlotte, how do you see this particular aspect of the proposal? So as Marcella said, it is a very long piece of proposed legislation. Um, but about this general principle, I can say, um, you know, I think making enforcement decisions is a role of the antitrust enforcement agencies, but it is also absolutely appropriate for Congress to come in and say, you know, these are the priorities that we want and we are passing a law to say that the law is going to be different in this one industry. Um, so I, uh, you know, I think um, Hovenkamp was talking not only about this uh, very long legislation that was focused on China, but also about the big tech bills. Um, and those big tech bills, I think, are very important. And it is a way of Congress sort of regaining, um, re retaking the reins and regaining its power and saying, you know, you have not been doing enough on big tech. These companies are too powerful and we are going to pass some new laws to um give the enforcers additional tools that they need to um, really achieve the, the goals that Congress has for them. And that's exactly how the system ought to be working. Awesome, thank you. So uh, we are getting to our last question and, and here is the breaking news from past week is that the President Biden signed an executive order specifically aiming at promoting competition in the US economy. I think like everyone heard about that the past week and it has several different measures with many different focuses, uh, but some are specifically targeted towards antitrust enforcement. Um, the FTC and the DOJ have already released a joint statement saying that they believe this order entails the need for a review of the merger guidelines. Uh, do you believe it's necessary? Um, and if so, what do you think it needs to change? So I do think that would be valuable. Um, we spoke last year, two years ago now, about um, the possibility of updating the vertical merger guidelines. There were a couple of workshops uh, scheduled to talk about that and we submitted comments. Um, so that is absolutely something that needs to be addressed. Um, but the horizontal merger guidelines, um, I think would benefit from an update as well. And there was so much more in this executive order. Um, it was really uh, wide reaching, um, covering a lot of different industries, including dominant digital platforms, um, but also broadband and telecom, um, transportation and agriculture and a lot of different industries. So it was, um, you know, so heartening to see that the Biden administration is making competition such an important priority. Um, I do think, you know, there is so much more work to be done to implement this executive order. It really is a, a statement of principles and goals. Um, I think, you know, the agencies, um, not just the antitrust enforcement agencies, but agencies that are focused on particular industries have a lot of work to do as a result of this executive order, which is great. We need to um, make sure that we're following up to, to make sure that they are, are um, living up to these very high expectations that have been set. And I think Congress still needs to do their part. Um, there is only so much that the executive branch can do. I mean, there, there's a lot <laughs> and that was outlined in the executive order, but um, we are still gonna need new legislation from Congress. But I was very excited to see that. And, and I think there's gonna be a lot of changes coming. Well, uh, let me comment on that. I, I'm also glad to see how important competition policy is becoming uh, in this administration. In Brazil, at least, it's hard to see. Usually only macroeconomic agenda is really discussed uh, by the president and something that is in the politics here. So it's very interesting to see that uh, competition policy is playing a different role in the U.S. And this is important because the U.S. is a reference for most of the jurisdictions regarding competition policy. So this is huge. It is something important. And But regarding the, the, the guidelines itself, uh, if you could name two or three topics that is that are more important 
uh, to be updated or the concepts that you really miss in the, the former guidelines? What would you choose? So I think it would be helpful to have um, some additional presumptions, um, particularly focusing on acquisitions of nascent competitors. Um, so I think this is an area uh, that I've focused on because of my focus on dominant digital platforms, but maybe appropriate in other industries as well, when there is great uncertainty. And I think that is the situation we're often in with nascent competitors, um, but in particular in technology industries where things are moving quickly. When there is great uncertainty, it can be really difficult to determine whether it's appropriate to bring a case or not. Um, trying to make those predictions about how the market is going to go can be difficult and it can, I think, deter the enforcers from bringing a case that really might be important. In the case of dominant digital platforms, it's very clear to us um, that a nascent competitor might sometimes be the only source of competition that these platforms are going to face. Um, hopefully, if we get the, the new big tech legislation, uh, we can have dynamic competition. But right now, it's really just competition for monopoly. Um, and so a nascent competitor might actually exert competitive pressure because the dominant platform might fear losing that uh, monopoly position. Um, and yet, that company might be very small. It might not have a lot of users. It might not um, have an apparent significant competitive impact yet. Um, and so you might have enforcers, you know, not bringing that case. I think having presumptions um, that would help, uh, you know, put a thumb on the scale in favor of bringing that case would be really valuable. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Marcella, do you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to briefly mention that I think one of the things that's struck me as interesting in the executive order by Biden was that it not necessarily in those words, but it basically mentioned that open banking would have to happen in the U.S., um, which is something that, you know, maybe Brazil is uh, a little bit in advantage here. We adopted the open banking model. And I mean, this week we're we're recording this in July. So it's, you know, coming into force um, for for individuals, right? Individuals will be able to request that their data is ported from one place to the other. Um, and I think, I mean, considering the U.S. economy, that will be very hard. As Charlie mentioned, it's a lot of work. Like, how, how do you actually do that? Um, portability is very interesting in theory, but it's very hard to implement. Um, but in banking and financial sector as a whole, there are several other examples like Brazil, the UK, India, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand um, that that could help. And um, it, it also struck me as interesting, mostly because, you know, there is the general interoperability slash portability uh, obligation in the bills. So, you know, those things could work together um, and take us somewhere. And I, I thought it would it, it would be very interesting to see how this will be implemented in practice. Um, it's hard to say, but let's wait and see. Thank you, Marcella. So um, I think it was like a wonderful meeting. Um, I learned a lot. There are so many things going on, many news initiatives, bills. Uh, thanks, Charlotte, Marcella, and Sylvia for helping us navigating in this, understanding what's going on. Um, um, I agree with Marcella, like, let's see what happens in the future. I'm so curious. Um, I think that uh, the next years are going to be really curious for antitrust development. So thank you so very much. Uh, it was an honor talking to you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. It was very interesting to discuss those topics with you. Yes, for me as well. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Obrigado por ouvir esse episódio do IbraCast, o podcast produzido e disponibilizado pelo IBRAC, o Instituto Brasileiro de Estudos de Concorrência, Consumo e Comércio Internacional. Visite nosso site, ibrac.org.br, para conhecer todos os nossos comitês especializados, nossos eventos e nosso vasto material biográfico disponível. Nos encontramos no próximo episódio do IbraCast. Até lá! As opiniões aqui expostas não necessariamente representam aquelas do IBRAC e das instituições a que estão vinculadas os participantes.